All right, it is seven o'clock Central Standard Time here in the great state of Alabama, and we are going to begin our Wednesday night Bible study. For anyone who has not uh, participated in our Bible studies in the past, especially those we do from our home, let me just give you a quick uh, rundown of how we do it. It's very casual. Uh, we are doing the study at the moment at our home. Uh, part of that is because of the laws here in Alabama, and uh, so we don't have any issues, you know, using our home for Bible study. And uh, uh, also, so we're not um, running up the utilities at the space that we use for our worship services. And uh, right now we don't have any local members. We're trying to get some folks to come out and be supportive of what we're trying to do. So obviously it kind of makes sense to keep uh, our, our expenses as low as possible. So I hope y'all will understand that. So we're gonna be doing our Bible study from our new home here in Decatur, Alabama. We invite people to come and be with us. We uh, do not publish the address online uh, for safety reasons, to be honest. So what we ask people to do is give us a uh, text, an instant message, or a phone call, whatever you want, or an email. You can email us at uh, forward clc, all one word, at yahoo.com, or you can give us a call at 256 755 5725. And if you shoot us a message, we will send you back the address in a text form. And then that way you can put it right into your GPS. By doing that, we at least have a record of, of anyone and everyone who requests our address. And uh, we also know then to expect you. And that helps us, you know, so we know if we're waiting on somebody or if we're expecting someone. Okay, but if you're able and you live in the Huntsville, Decatur area, we would love for you to come and be part of our Wednesday night Bible studies. I would ask you to pray for me. Uh, as most of our regular uh, viewers know, our ministry has a friend. I have a friend, a man I've known now for, oh heavens, nigh on 30 years. And... Um, he has been supportive of my ministry for many, many years, decades. And he's a lovely uh, Christian man, part of the LGBT community. He lives up in the New York City area. And uh, back at the beginning of April, he fell and hurt himself. And he is unable to walk at the moment. So they have him in a rehab facility in uh, on Long Island. So uh, I am going to be flying up to New York tomorrow so I can spend some time with him and anoint him with oil and pray for him. And um, so be in prayer for me. Uh, I'm actually going to take the opportunity while I'm up in that neck of the woods uh, to make a quick trip into Connecticut. It's about a two hour drive. Um, that's my home state. That's where I was born and raised. And uh, when I get up that way, I like to be able to go home. You know how it is. Uh, anybody that's lived far away from home for a long period of time, uh, you know how you just long uh, to be home sometimes, you know, to, to go back to your roots. So uh, after I visit Claude, I will be running uh, into Connecticut just for a day. And then on Saturday afternoon, I'll be flying back. So keep me in prayer that the Lord will give me safe passage. Uh, I've mentioned before, but I'll mention again. Um, we have had a very, very successful and uh, burgeoning, I might say, uh, internet ministry for many, many years. And this is why it was so important to us 
to get our services back up and running online as quickly as we could, uh, even before we were able to establish any local folks to come and be with us and help us. Uh, we have people all over the world, not just in America, but all over the world, who count on our ministry. They, uh, it's funny because over the years, I've had people actually send me texts if I was a little late getting a sermon published to the web or what have you, uh, before we were even doing our live services, you know. And I'd have people send me a message, an email, or a text, whatever, say, Pastor, you know, are you going to be publishing the service this week, and blah, blah, blah. And so people really count on us. Um, many people live places where they don't have an affirming ministry available to them, so our ministry is very important to them. So um, when we moved here to uh, Alabama, there was a couple of weeks we weren't able to do services, and I tried to, to expedite getting up uh, online as quickly as we could, getting our services going once again, and we were able to rent that little um, warehouse office space that we're in now, and we put down some carpet, we put in some furniture, I built a platform, um, we decorated a little bit, put in some plants, as you know, and so now we have a little worship space that will accommodate about 40 people. And uh, we're working on the necessary requirements to get a certificate of occupancy as a church. Right now we have it uh, certified as a, a video studio, quote unquote, you know, because we're, we're videotaping our services and our messages from there. Um, our online members are extremely important to us. Um, I've been in affirming ministry now for 30 years. This year is my 30th year of affirming ministry. And obviously I miss having local folks that I can minister to and be there for. Folks, that's part of ministry, you know. Um, there are a lot of people who are critical of pastors and, you know, they want to sit back and say, all they do is get up and preach and, you know, and people just pour money into their coffers. And that, of course, is not true. But pastors do far more than just preach and teach, um, if, if they're a real pastor, that is. Uh, in today's world, there are mega churches and people are herded, not shepherd, uh, shepherded. Uh, I believe in shepherding. So that means when one of my members is in a nursing home or a facility of some kind long term, I normally would go see them on a regular basis, uh, minister to them and visit with them and spend time with them. Uh, if people are in the hospital, we visit them in the hospital. If we have uh, members whose loved ones are in jail or in prison, we go and visit them there. You know, this sort of thing. If we have shut-ins, people in our, in our church uh, who are old or infirmed and not able to come to church, then I would go to their home and spend time with them in their home. Um, and it's not just people who are part of the church, but even if one of my church members knows someone who is shut in or knows someone who is in jail or what have you, uh, they let me know and I'm happy to go and see them. Well, since we don't really have um, a membership, at least at the moment, um, our internet members, which we refer to as extended members, our extended members are every bit as important to us as local members. So if we have an extended member who is going through something that really requires ministry, it really requires that they be able to get a pastoral visit, then I'm going to do whatever I have to do. I'm going to try my best to get out there and minister to them and visit with them and spend time with them. So um, in the past, you know, we uh, I've, I've gone, you know, to Austin to be with one of our dear <clears throat> longtime uh, extended members who was going through surgery, been able to visit Kansas. Hello, 
uh, Brady and Camille um, up in Kansas, you know, so we could uh, visit with Amy and Clint and the kids and minister to them there and love that. I would love them. They've been longtime uh, members of our fellowship online, and we love them to death. And if they ever need us, uh, Amy knows you all you have to do, honey, is give me a holler. You know, send me a message, an email, call me, and you know we'll be there. And uh, I'll find a way. Well, Claude is in this nursing home, and I, it's sad to say he has been part of an affirming church in that area where he lives for uh, quite a number of years now. It's been well over a decade. And uh, right now, they've got him in a rehab facility that would probably take about two hours to drive from Manhattan uh, or three hours roughly by train to get to. And the pastor of that ministry has not made any effort whatsoever to go out and spend time with him. Uh, that really bothers me a lot. And uh, because that's not how I believe pastoral ministry ought to work. And that man has been immensely, I mean hugely, financially supportive of that ministry. He's been uh, wonderfully supportive of our ministry. And he's been faithful to a fault. And he absolutely ought to be uh, visited by the pastor. So since... He doesn't seem to be getting any pastoral care locally. Uh, I'm going to make sure he gets some. And so I'll fly up tomorrow <clears throat> morning, spend the day with him. I'm not just going to spend an hour or two. I'll probably spend a large part of the day. And uh, I'll, I may even go back on Saturday again and spend a little bit of time with him again on Saturday. And uh, But I'll just take Friday to run into Connecticut and... Uh, and, and uh, I grew up on a pizza parlor in Seymour, Connecticut. Tommy knows it is the best pizza this side of heaven. I'm, t I'm telling you right now, it is. It's Greek pizza. Uh, if you've never had Greek pizza, you need to find a pizza palace that's operated by Greek folks because Greek pizza, in my mind, uh, is so much better than Italian pizza. I don't care who invented it. All I know is I love my Greek pizza. And so when I get up home, one of the things that I always, always have to do, I've got to go by Zoe's and uh, get me a pizza. I told Tommy, I said, I'll try and see if I can't uh, bring you home one, you know, get a small one. I'll carry it on the plane for him. I don't care. I'm not embarrassed. And, uh, I've taken people to this place over the years, and uh, everybody I've ever taken to Zoe's, literally everybody I've ever taken there has just gone nuts over the pizza and said, oh my goodness, this is the best pizza I've ever had in my life. A girl I dated when I was a teenager, um, literally, I was about you know 15, I got my license at 16, I took her there. And she and I are friends to this day, love Barbara to death. And she uh, tells me, she said, I still go there whenever I get the opportunity because the pizza is just out of this world. It's, it's amazing. Anyway, I don't want to bore you with all that. But I try to be a little bit more casual for our Bible studies. And I kind of try to set that mood and, and set that atmosphere for the moment, okay? So if you come to the house, we will have soft drinks. We will have coffee and tea or hot cocoa if you'd like it. Um, if, once we get some folks coming, we'll be certain to have some kind of uh, uh, snacks that you can snack on, donuts or something. So come on out if you live in the area and be with us. We're going to be, for the next, I dare say it'll take a couple of months because those of you that know me know I really like to go into great detail. I, like, I don't just brush through these subjects. I like to 
uh, be as careful with them and as extensive with them as I possibly can. We're going to be looking at the subject of the gifts of the Spirit. And I think that this subject matter will be a tremendous blessing to you. Before we start, I'd like us to go to the Lord in prayer. Also, be prayerful for Tommy. He's off camera today. He's laying over here on the sofa because uh, he's going through... Uh, He's got a condition that he has wrestled with for many years in his gut, and it causes him a lot of grief sometimes. What do they call that? Di diver Diverticulosis. Diverticulosis. And uh, sometimes he really suffers with that, and today has been a really hard day for him. So we're going to pray for him, and I ask you to pray for him and believe the Lord to touch him as well. And let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll we'll get into our Bible study subject matter. Father, today, God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together as the people of God. It's a blessing and an encouragement, Lord, to see so many who have uh, chosen at this moment to join us online for our Bible study, the subject matter that we'll embark upon over the next several weeks weeks and months possibly to come is an extremely important subject matter. I ask God that the Holy Ghost from heaven would descend upon this place, that you would touch the teacher. Help me, Lord, to thoroughly, clearly, plainly uh, articulate the truths of your word concerning the gifts of the Spirit, that the people of God might be edified, that they might grow and mature and come to a place, oh God, where uh, they're able to not only understand the subject, but experience the gifts in their own lives. Master, we all desire to be used of you. We all desire, Lord, that you would be able to use us to be a blessing and an encouragement to a lost world. And we ask God today that you would equip us at this hour to do just that. We lift up Tommy today, Lord, and ask God right now in the name of Jesus, upon the authority of God's word, that you would touch his body from head to toe, be a healer and a help and a deliverer in the name of Jesus. Lord, the word of God declares that through the authority of your name, we have power over sickness and disease and infirmity. We ask God right now that you would touch him with your divine hand. We lift up Claude today, Lord. We ask God that you would touch him, that you would expedite his recovery. We know, Lord, he wants to go home. And we ask God that you would just touch him in a wonderful way. Even now, as we pray, let him feel the hand of God in his room. Let him feel the presence of the Lord enveloping him. Lord, there's nothing like the, the hug of love that we receive from the Holy Ghost. And Master, right now in his lonely hour, we ask God that you would touch him, heal him, deliver him by your divine hand. Give us safe passage to and from New York, Lord, this weekend as I go up that way to visit with uh, this man who has been such a blessing, such a help. Uh, such an encouragement over the years to this preacher and to this ministry we could not have done for so many years we could not have done all that we did were it not for his help and we appreciate him and we ask God that you would bless him for his faithfulness and his generosity Master, in the name of Jesus, there are so many needs. People have lost loved ones, including my cousin. Uh, people today are suffering with sickness and disease. We ask God right now in the name of Jesus that if there is a need associated with any individual who's participating in this Bible study, whether it be live or whether it later be by reason of recording on YouTube, we ask, Lord, that you would look Look down and see the need and minister to their need right now. Lord, those who are struggling with financial issues, 
We ask God that you would reach down and minister to that need. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. Lord, every resource of heaven and earth is at your disposal. And we ask God that you would help those who are struggling financially, those who today, Lord, need food, need shelter, need homes. We ask God that you would reach out and touch them. Those today, Lord, who are struggling with sickness and disease, touch their bodies. Be a healer, be a deliverer in the name of Jesus. Those struggling with addiction and bondage, we ask God that the chains of addiction would be broken right now in the name of Jesus upon the authority of God's word. Lord, there are some who are studying and going to school and they're struggling. And we ask God that you would touch them and help them, give them the wisdom, the ability to retain the information they need to retain so that they might be successful in their endeavors. We thank you, Lord, for being a good God. And the word of God declares, cast all our care upon you because you are our caregiver. And we thank you, Lord, for answered prayer, even in advance. We ask all this and none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the Lord. All right. We are looking at the subject of the gifts of the Spirit. I want to lay a little bit of quick groundwork where this subject matter is concerned. If you don't come from a Pentecostal or what is referred to as a spirit-filled or full gospel uh, church background, you may not quite understand uh, this subject. So if I lay a little bit of foundation, it might help you. There is a world of difference between a spirit-filled church or a Pentecostal church uh, or what is often referred to as a full gospel church and other many other churches, mainline denominations, and uh, uh, you know Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Presbyterian, so on and so forth. Uh, the difference in the Pentecostal message is really quite simple. Number one, we believe God is real. God is as real to me as the nose on my face, and I've got a big nose. So if he's as real to me as the nose on my face, let me tell you, he's pretty real. Uh, the Pentecostal message is a message uh, not of simply believe this message. A lot of a lot of churches, if you really look at the structure of their belief system, what it amounts to is this. Basically, they say to their adherents, okay, we have this fictional little uh, fairy tale about a man named Jesus and all these miracles and all these wonderful things that used to happen way back when, and if you're going to get into heaven, you've got to believe this little fairy tale. And a lot of people, if they were really honest about it, they would acknowledge that they see it this way. That in their mind and in their heart, it's really more or less a fairy tale. And, you know, it's just a story. But... I, I profess that I believe it. You know, I, 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 I kind of, you know, I, I say that I accept it and I say that I believe it. And, and to the best of their ability, they do believe it. But the full gospel message, the spirit-filled life message, the Pentecostal message is not a message of, oh, this is, you know, a person, and this is events, and these are miracles that transpired thousands of years ago, and you've got to somehow find a way to profess that you believe in this story, and you believe in this fairy tale. No, the message of the uh, Spirit-filled church, the Apostolic Pentecostal Church, 
is one that starts on the premise that God is real. There is nothing he did a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago or six thousand years ago that he does not still do. He spoke to men six thousand years ago. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Moses. You know, he still speaks to us today if we allow him to do so. If we come into relationship with him, if we approach him with sincere faith, the message of salvation, the uh, the plan of salvation that is preached by this ministry and this church is consistent with a movement within the Pentecostal movement that is referred to and called uh, the Apostolic Church. And that message is this, when someone asks me, what must I do to be saved? The answer is what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, which was in fact the birthday of the Christian church. And our answer is this, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children, to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You see, the salvation plan actually is built on the premise, if you think about it, the message we preach is built on the premise that God is real. Because it's not just a matter of believe this message. No, if you believe this message, then you need to act upon it. Well, how do you act upon it? You act upon it in the way that the Apostle Peter prescribed on the day of Pentecost. You repent, you turn from unbelief and lack of faith to faith and belief in God. Secondly, you follow that faith up with baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. At that point, according to the word of God, we're buried with him in baptism. Symbolically, we're raised to newness of life. Then the message includes receive the Holy Ghost. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. This is where God becomes real. It's not just a matter of believe this message, believe this little fairy tale that's in this book we call the Bible. No, no, no. That same Jesus who died 2,000 years ago, rose from the dead, uh, is in fact the physical embodiment of God Almighty. And when he returned to heaven after what is referred to as the ascension, he promised the church that he would return by reason of his spirit and he would fill each believer. He would literally come in by his spirit into the life of every single child of God. And that is part of the born again experience. When the Spirit of God comes into our life, he breathes new life, just like he breathed into the nostrils of Adam, the first man at creation. The Bible said, and God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living soul. Well, according to the word of God, as unbelievers, we're all walking around as dead souls. We're living men, but our souls are not alive. Our soul within us is dead. That's why the word of God says we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. Our spiritual man is dead. Our physical man is alive, but our spiritual man is dead. Well, when God comes into our life by reason of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, what he is doing is breathing new life into our spiritual man, and our soul comes to life. This is why Jesus said, He that believeth on me shall never die. 
Well, why is that? Because a person who has a, a dead soul, as it were, when they die, they're dead. They're both spiritually dead and they're physically dead. Okay? But resurrection's going to come even for the unbeliever because they got to stand before God in the judgment and then there's eternity to contend with. Now, when you look at the story in the book of Acts of the coming of the Holy Ghost, look at the narrative. The Word of God says, and, on the day, and uh, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, listen, suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they all began, <coughs> excuse me, to speak with other tongues, or they began to speak in another language as the Spirit gave them the utterance. So the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God came into their lives, they became enabled in their spirit man. Their spirit man comes to life. Well, what happens when a baby comes out of its mother's womb. There are two things that happen, which is really interesting. Because the born again, the message of salvation that we preach is actually a type of the physical birth. It's modeled after the physical birth. There are two primary things that happen. One, the water breaks. Baptism in water in Jesus' name. Secondly, the child has to make a noise. You have to hear an utterance from that child to know that it's breathing and it's healthy and it's well. That's why back in the old days, they used to smack the baby on the butt. What a way to come into the world, right? Uh, they used to give the baby a little smack on the behind so it would cry. And when a born-again believer breaks the water in baptism, what they're in essence doing is that's the first part of the new birth experience. When they receive the Holy Ghost, that's the second part. That is them taking their breath, you know, taking their first breath. And then the utterance, the speaking in another language, which a lot of people who don't understand uh, the Pentecostal message are afraid of that. You know, they, they think this is some big scary thing. And I like to be able to try to explain this to people so you understand it is not, it's not even remotely scary. Uh, you are not out of control. You are not being controlled by something or someone else. The Word of God says clearly in the book of Acts, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, meaning simply, as the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God enabled them to do so. What happens is simply this. When the Spirit of God comes into our life and our spiritual man is born again, because the born again experience is an internal experience, not an external experience. When our spiritual man is born again and we receive the Holy Ghost and we take that breath in and we breathe in God, as it were, what happens is our spiritual man, our spirit, will begin to worship God. Our spirit will begin to pray. Our spirit will begin to express thanksgiving and gratitude to the Lord. And when it does, it does, it does so in another language different than the language you know cognitively. If you know 30 languages and you're able to speak 30 languages when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will not speak any one of those 30 languages. You will speak a language that you do not know. This becomes the evidence to the church, and this becomes the evidence to the believer that they have received the Holy Ghost. This is why we refer to speaking with other tongues as the initial physical evidence 
of ones receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you look at the Word of God, if you look at the history of the early church in the book of Acts, uh, every believer who is recorded as receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost spoke with other tongues. So, and they and they would say that um, that this happened, and this is how the church knew these people had received the Holy Ghost. That is how Peter and the Jews who went with them to the house of Cornelius knew that Cornelius had received the Holy Ghost. If receiving the Holy Ghost were a quiet transaction that was not followed by any kind of physical evidence, they wouldn't have known. But when they saw the house of Cornelius received the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues and magnify God, then they were like, aha, look, they have the same experience that we had in the beginning. <coughs> so speaking with other tongues is not a scary thing. You remain very much in control. The word of God says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. But what happens is you will literally find that your uh your speech mechanism, you're, you think you're just talking. You feel like you're just speaking, and you are. The only difference is because your spirit man is behind the vocalization rather than your physical mind or what have you, your brain is not engaged. Your mind is not forming words and putting things together. You literally will find that it's just flowing out of you. The, the words are just coming. They're just flowing. You're not having to think about them. You're not having to form, you know, thoughts and put it together. All you have to do is yield to the Spirit of God and let the Lord come in, and it happens. It's not scary. It's not fearful. You do not feel like you've lost control and something else is in charge of your body and all this. Unfortunately, there are a lot of, uh, over the years, there have been a lot of people who word things and, and describe things and teach things in ways uh, that have left people with wrong thinking. You know, there are certain churches uh, in the minority community, I'll, I'll, I'll say it that way, who often refer to as, oh, he caught the Holy Ghost. You know, that person caught the Holy Ghost, and, and that's why they, they spoke in tongues, or that's why they uh, uh, danced or shouted or what have you. And it makes it seem like the Spirit of the Lord comes down, grabs you, and makes you do something. No, it doesn't work that way. When the Spirit of God touches our spiritual man, there's, there is a response, there is a reaction. Our spiritual man reacts. What is, what is strange about it is simply the fact that we're not accustomed to yielding to and letting our spiritual man be expressive. That's something that, you know, the unbeliever doesn't do. So that's kind of the new part of it. And you learn to simply, uh, uh, when you're praying and when you're seeking God, you learn to simply yield to your spiritual man. Paul said when... Uh, you pray in tongues when you pray in another language as the Spirit of God gives the utterance that he said, my spirit prays. So it's your spirit praying, but it's doing so with the help of God's Spirit within you, okay? It's not a big scary thing. So now, having said that, the message of the full gospel is not simply believe the gospel, but once you have believed the gospel, you will receive the spirit of the one we preach, Jesus. He is not some historical figure. He is not some person we read about from 2,000 years ago. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost makes God real, brings God into the present, and makes him relevant to our lives. 
So all of a sudden, God is no longer this fictional character in heaven with a long white beard that we don't know and we don't understand. No, now the Spirit of God is within us, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, whatever term you want to use, it's all one and the same. But the Spirit of the Lord is within us. And now we have a very real, very relevant, very living uh, walk with God. And that is the Pentecostal message. That is the full gospel message. Okay, so now having said that, the gifts of the Spirit are something um, a little different. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit are a number of supernatural uh, I'm going to use this word for lack of a better word abilities that are God-given and they are given to the church uh, in order to help the church do the work that God has called us to do. He's called us to, number one, he's called us to reach out to the lost. He's called us to reach out to the unsaved. But number two, the work of the church is to encourage and equip believers. So part of the responsibility of the church is not just to reach out to the lost, but also to build up those who already are in the church. Okay, so... In order to maintain our faith in God and our walk with God, just like a car, you got to come in for maintenance. You know, you got to keep the oil up. You got to keep the coolant up. If a, if a uh, hose breaks, you know, you got to fix the hose. If you have an issue, uh, something is uh, off or broken, you got to get it fixed so the car can run properly. The same is true for believers. If we're going to walk with God and be everything that we are called to be, then we require maintenance. And the church is there, the Word of God says, to equip the saints. It's all about keeping us running, keeping us working properly, you know, being able to function properly. And by that I mean um, situations and circumstances come in our lives that sometimes overwhelm us, and, and sometimes uh, those things can come against our faith, and they can cause us to question our faith. They can cause us to doubt our walk with God. Um, when we go to the house of God, the word of the Lord said, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When we go to the house of the Lord, we are encouraged and we are equipped to hold fast to our faith and keep marching and keep walking. Then at the same time, the gifts of the Spirit of God are given to the church not only to help equip us uh, in terms of teaching and understanding and uh, wisdom and these sorts of things, but also the gifts of the Spirit are in the church to help believers, listen carefully, to help believers have the best possible life they can have. A lot of people don't, I, I don't think a lot of people really realize this. They don't think about this. And we're going to get into it in a minute. But gifts like a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom, these things, folks, you have no idea what an important role these gifts can play in the life of a believer. They help to guide us. They help to give us direction when we're at an impasse, you know, when we're in, at a, in a position in our life where we don't know what to do or which direction to go in. By reason of a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, the Lord often communicates to us exactly what we need to do and what we need to do to have the best outcome, okay? And I've experienced in my own lifetimes, and I've talked about it before, you know, where 
I was uh, going through a rough spot with my mother, for instance, when I was a teenager living in Texas, and the Lord had called me to Texas. And my mom came down <clears throat> with my brothers. Uh, she and my father separated, uh, which honestly, to be honest, was a long time in coming. Um, and she came to Texas, and my father wound up calling her and giving her a big song and dance about how he had changed and, you know, and, and how everything was going to be different. And my father is a, uh, a, a horrendous narcissist. I mean, a, a horrible narcissist. And everything with him is about manipulation and control. He was just mad my mother left and that he couldn't control the situation. So he's given her this big song and dance. Well, I knew that was not going to happen. He was still going to womanize. He was still going to be a cheater like he'd always been a cheater for 20 years of marriage. And I tried to tell my mother, and, and she wanted me to go back with my brothers and she to Connecticut. I said, listen, the Lord called me to Texas. I'm not going anywhere. If you want to go back, go back. <laughs> I think you're nuts, but if you want to go back, you go back. But I'm staying in Texas. Well, she and I wound up just go constantly kind of arguing over. I was only 17 at the time. Uh, you know, we were arguing about it, and there was a lot of contention between us and all this. So I went to my pastor, and y'all have heard me talk about Brother Gillum, one of the wisest men, uh, greatest, one of the mar most marvelous pastors that I've ever sat under. I loved him. Talk about the power of God and the, the anointing and uh, the gifts of the Spirit and all this. Brother Gillum's church was just a wonderful, wonderful example of what a church should be. Well, I went to Brother Gillum and I told him, you know, about what was going on between my mother and I. And I said, Pastor, I just don't know what to do. I, I really just don't know what to do. And Brother Gillum said to me, he said, Chuck, you need to go back up north with your mom. He said, you don't need to, to have this ongoing division between you and your mother and have this ongoing, you know, bitterness and ugliness between you and your mom. He said, you need to go back with your mom, he said, and if the Lord wants you back here, he will make it so that you're able to come back. He said, but at least you will have honored your mother and you will have, you know, uh, kept the peace with her by doing it that way. Well, when he spoke these words to me, all of a sudden I felt the, oh, I could feel the presence of God come over me like a blanket. I could feel the Holy Ghost. So what that is, is that's the Spirit of the Lord confirming to you, you've just heard a word of wisdom, meaning you have just been given not just advice from the mind of J.T. Gillum, but the Spirit of the Lord has used Brother Gillum to convey to you a word of wisdom. That means that Brother Gillum just gave me wise counsel straight from the Lord. So I knew I could feel it. I knew I said, I just got a word of wisdom. I went to my mother. I said, okay, I'm going to go back with you. I said, but if the Lord wants me to come back to Texas, he's, he'll make a way and I'll come back. And she said, okay. So we kind of come to terms with, you know, long story short, I went. God did things that would blow your mind, and he made it abundantly clear uh, that I was to go back to Texas, and he, pay, he made a way for me to do so, and I did go back to Texas, but I was able to maintain peace in my family. Do you see the wisdom in that? You see? So anyway, uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are there, the gifts of healing and all these different things, and I'm going to get into it in a moment. These things are there to help us live good lives, to help us live positive lives, to help us live healthy lives. Uh, I mean, the gifts of the Spirit are so important to a believer. Those of you that watch our sermons and our, our Sunday services, 
I talked last Sunday about super saints, and I talked about the fact that as believers, the Word of God said we're a royal priesthood, we're a chosen people, we're a holy nation, we're a peculiar people. Uh, we live by a different set of rules. We live under a different set of laws, as it were. Well, the gifts of the Spirit are part and parcel of that new set of laws that we live under. Okay, The gifts of the Spirit are how we live in this world, but we benefit from our nationality actually being heaven. You know, heaven and God's kingdom actually being our true nation. Uh, we benefit from, from uh, our citizenship in the kingdom of God and the family of God through the gifts of the Spirit. Okay? I hope. I was saying at least some kind of groundwork with that. We're going to begin at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, I always use the King James text. The King James text reads, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried up away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say, that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. I, I want you to remember that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord. There's a difference between saying that Jesus is Lord and saying that Jesus is the Lord, okay? but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Meaning, the manifestation of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are given to every individual, not to be of specific benefit to them, but to be of benefit to the church as a whole and to all people. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues or diversities of languages, to, to say it plainly, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. All right, so Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, the Corinthian church is a Gentile church. They're non-Jewish. A lot of the apostles, if you read the epistles, the letters written by the apostles of Jesus Christ 
to the different churches, you know, uh, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Thessalonians, uh, so on and so forth. When you read the epistles, uh, a lot of times, if you really pay attention, you'll notice that they almost had a fixation with Gentiles. There, there, there was a certain obsession. That's a good word. There was a certain obsession with the Gentiles. You have to understand, folks, the apostles were all Jewish. They all came up under the law of Moses. The Gentile world to them was very foreign. It's kind of like me growing up. I grew up in a fundamentalist, evangelical, Pentecostal church. Uh, when I came out in 1989, I was, all of a sudden, I was in the secular world. And let me tell you something, you might as well have thrown me in a volcano because I was so naive and stupid. I didn't know nothing. I didn't understand how the real world worked. My whole life had been centered around the church. My whole life had been um, all about the church. Uh, I had dealt with as many Christian people as I could deal with. Uh, I went to a Christian chiropractor. You know, I mean, you, 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 everything you do, you try to do kind of with, not within your denomination even, but just within the family of faith, okay? And, uh, and a lot of Christian people, you wonder why Christian people are so homophobic. You wonder why Christian people are so uh, xenophobic. You wonder why they're uh, in today's world with the leadership of a demon like Donald Trump, why Christian people, you know, can be so, quote unquote, closed minded. Well, the problem is that most especially evangelical and uh, fundamentalist Christians, the only thing they know about the real world at all is what they hear the preacher tell them. That's all they know. Uh, and they, they tend to be very cloistered. They tend to be very closed off. Most Christian, not all, most Christian people do not make any effort whatsoever to expose themselves to people who drink or people who go to bars or people who are, are gay or lesbian. You know what I'm saying? Anybody who believes or lives contrary to what they're taught is the right way, they tend to avoid. And then they go to church, and depending on what kind of preacher they've got, the preacher gets up there and tells them that gay people are wicked, they're child molesters, they're this, they're that, they're ba ba da ba ba da ba ba da ba And then they walk away believing that. I grew up in a fundamentalist evangelical church. Let me tell you a little secret. When I came out in 1989, I believed most of that garbage. I literally believed it. I, I, I don't mean I, I sort of kind of believed it. When I walked into my first LGBT uh, establishment, I didn't know if I wasn't going to get raped. I didn't know if I wasn't going to get molested. Because the way I heard it told, you know, gay people are just these sexual deviants and they're perverts and they have no morals and they have no uh, control and you know blah, blah 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 it literally took me a couple of years after coming out and being exposed to hundreds and hundreds of people in the LGBT community it literally took me a couple of years to break out of a lot of that negative stereotyping this is why there is so much um, uh, self-loathing in the LGBT community because people who have grown up being indoctrinated, I'm going to use the word brainwashed, being brainwashed into believing all these negative things about LGBT people, uh, even after they come out, it takes, depending on, you know, how uh, how they approach things in terms of how they look at things and how they 
uh, uh, trying to think of the best word I want to use here, you know, how they, um, digest, you know, what they see and what have you, um, it can take a long time for people to break out of a lot of these false mindsets and false beliefs and all these stereotypical beliefs. I believed for years and years and years because I always heard gay people aren't interested in love, they're not interested in relationships, they're just interested in sex. So when I came out, I had that belief. I absolutely believed, you know, I knew I wanted something different. I knew I wanted something more. But I literally thought I was the odd duck out. I didn't think there was anybody else in the LGBT community who felt the way I did about love and felt the way I did about relationships. And, uh... I remember one time I'd gone to a pride parade in New York City and I, I was dating somebody and I met some friends of theirs who had been together for a very, very long time. And I made a comment to them about how I thought it was great that they'd been together so long, you know, and how that, you know, that's not uh, the norm in the LGBT community and there aren't any people in the LGBT community who uh, are like that, it's very rare, you know. And these guys were older, they were a little bit older than, well, quite a bit older than me. And I remember one of them expressing disgust. He said, you know, he said, that crap gets on my nerve. He said, I, it drives me crazy when I hear young LGBT people talk like that. And I understand how it feels, because now I'm the same identical way. He said, that is so not true. What you're saying is so not true. He said, we have dozens of friends who have been together for long periods of time. I know dozens of people who are in committed, monogamous, long-term relationships, you know. He said, you go to the bars and you go to the clubs and you hook up with some slut Pardon me, folks, I talk plainly. You hook up with some slut who's just looking for a quickie. Well, if you fish in a polluted pond, you're going to get a polluted fish. Said, you know, where you go looking for stuff, you're going to get what's there. Said, bars and clubs are not the place to shop for a husband, a wife, a partner, a spouse. You know, anyway, and, you know, he expressed all these things to me. But uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to get to a point here concerning the apostles and in their writings. They had a certain view of the Gentile world, okay? And the Gentile world in the Jewish mind was a godless, heathenistic ungodly, immoral world. That doesn't mean that everybody in the Gentile world was necessarily like that. Many of the Gentiles, of course, worshipped a variety of different gods, like the Romans and the Greeks and what have you. They worshipped a number of different gods. But again, even within the framework of their worshiping different gods and therefore following different religions than the Jewish religion, that doesn't mean that their religion was necessarily without some sort of moral guidance, without some sort of rules, without some sort of boundaries for how people live, you know? But the assumption is well, they're godless, they're, they're idol worshipers, therefore they're heathens, they're horrible, they're filthy, they're dirty, they're immoral. And a lot of times I think you see in the writing of the apostles, you see so much writing about moral issues, about sex and about conduct. 
In the Gospels, you don't read that. Jesus never talked about all those things. Why in the world do the apostles spend so much time talking about them? Well, it's because they're coming from a perspective that the Gentile world is this horrible, filthy world full of idol worshiping pigs and dogs. Literally, that's how they used to refer to a, a Gentiles as dogs. Okay? They had the law. The Jews, the Jewish nation, had the law of Moses. They had, uh, from God's own mouth, they had all the rules and regulations that determined godliness and holiness and righteousness. And the Gentiles don't have the law. So therefore, there's this assumption if you don't have the law, then obviously you're not following any of these laws. Well, I know a lot of atheists, a lot of people who aren't Christians, a lot of people who, who aren't believers, people who are Buddhist, people who are um, Hindu, who live very moral, decent, clean lives. So in other words, just because they're not Christian, just because they don't worship the God of Israel and the God of Christianity, that doesn't mean that simply because they're not part of our faith that they're, God, that they're these horrible, godless, heathenistic, horrible people. No! There are a lot of good people. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I believe you need Jesus to be saved, okay? Being a good person, being a great person won't get you into heaven. But you still cannot simply apply this logic that because they're not Christian, you know, they're they're godless and they, you know, break all the rules. But that was the mindset and, and in in the Jewish world today, even amongst the more conservative Jews, it's still the same way. They look at Gentiles as just being off the hook, evil, wicked, filthy, terrible. Say, Pastor, why are you going into all that? Because this is how Paul started his conversation about the gifts of the Spirit with the church at Corinth said, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Then he says, ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols. Now, dumb idols, he's not, that's not a put down of the idols. He's saying idols which cannot speak. They do not have the ability to speak. Even as ye were led. Okay, so in other words, he's starting out by saying, I don't want you guys to not understand the gifts of the Spirit. I know y'all were not part of the Jewish faith, and you were led to believe in all these idols which are dead and cannot speak. Okay, so he's starting out. Again, it's kind of that premise that you guys are probably all screwed up in your thinking. You probably don't have a clue about nothing because after all, you're Gentiles and you were involved in all these idolatrous religion. That literally is what Paul is saying here. He said, wherefore, verse 3, 1 Corinthians 12, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So what Paul is saying here is nobody who has the Spirit of God in their life is going to speak ill or evil of Jesus Christ. He said, and furthermore, the only way, listen, the only way a man, a woman, a boy, a girl can speak and declare Jesus Christ is, listen carefully, the, T-H-E, Lord. He said that requires that they have the Holy Ghost working through them and in them. Because without revelation and understanding from God, 
on this issue. Nobody can say Jesus is the Lord. You talk to an unbeliever, you talk to a, a non-believer, a non-Christian, and you say, is Jesus the Lord? They're going to look at you now. He's not my Lord, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's not Lord to me. Um, excuse me. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord is Paul saying, listen carefully, the Jewish people have a phrase that they employ every time they pray, every time they go to God. They literally have this scripture in a little container over their doors in their homes. This is the law of Moses. They have to have this scripture over the door in their home. They have to have this scripture. If you have ever seen an Orthodox Jew, I lived in New York City for 10 years. They literally have a little square, like wooden box that they literally tie to their forehead. It literally sits right here. You see them wear the big rimmed hats, you know? That's to cover that little box that they have over their forehead. In that box is this scripture. This scripture is the foundation of Judaism. It is the first and most important truth of the Jewish faith. And guess what? It's also the first and most important truth to the Christian faith. And that scripture is Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is one person in this world, or excuse me, not person, there is one entity in this universe who is called God according to the Hebrew faith, okay? There are not a multitude of gods. The same one who is called God is the same one we call Lord. That passage is saying to the Jewish people, there is one God and he is Lord. And there is only one God and therefore there is only one Lord. And they are one and the same. When Paul says no man can say that, whoo, glory, that, whoo, glory, hallelujah, talk about feeling the Holy Ghost. When Paul says no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, there's only one who is called Lord, and that is God. So what Paul is literally saying is, no man can acknowledge the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. No man can declare Jesus is God, but by the Holy Ghost. So he's saying, the Spirit of the Lord has to reveal things to you. You know, the, uh, the Lord asked his disciples at one point, said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're uh, Elias uh, uh, reborn, and some say you're John the Baptist and uh, uh, reincarnate, you know, and others say you're a great man, and some say you're a prophet. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, the apostle Peter, jumped in and he said, Lord, he said, thou art the Christ, meaning the anointed one that God has promised from antiquity. That's what Christ means, the anointed one, the promised one, the Messiah, that God has promised from antiquity. But then there's a comma, and Peter says, Thou art the Christ, he says, comma, the Son of the living God. Again, this is an area where a lot of your... Um, Christian church doesn't, they don't understand even this. The term son of God, my friend, does not mean that he is somehow God's offspring and that eternally he has existed in heaven as a second person. That is not what that means. When a Jew would refer to a man, a human being, 
as the Son of God. See, if you don't understand Jewish theology and Jewish thinking, then you read these words and you just apply whatever reasoning you happen to have, you know. But when you understand the Jewish theology and Jewish thinking, you understand that the title Son of God, when it is referred to a human being, means you are a man who is born of God. You don't have an earthly father. God is your father. You have no other father but God. And the only way a man can be born of God, because God does not have sex organs. God does not. See, our God is not like the Roman gods. Our God is not like the Greek gods of antiquity. Uh, uh, the, the Jewish God, the God of the Jewish faith, is a spirit. Unlike the Roman gods who, according to uh, mythology, you know, used to come down and have sex with women, and then they would create babies, and that baby would be a uh, demigod, you know, which is part man, part God, okay? Our God is a spirit, and the Jewish people understand God is a spirit. So for a man to be born of God, what that literally means to the Jewish mind is, God has created flesh that he himself occupies. But because it is manifested in a human form, it is against Jewish teaching to refer to any man as God, period. Even if you know for a fact it's God manifest in the flesh. If you go back to the Old Testament and you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar comes to the edge of the furnace and he looks in and he said, didn't we throw three men in there? He said, yes, sir, we did. He said, well, I see four men walking all around. Four men. Isn't that what he said? And then he said, and the fourth one appears as the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know squat about any trinity. God, he didn't know nothing about a trinity. No, he was approaching things from a Jewish perspective. The fourth man appears as a God-man or as God in human form. Do you follow me? And that is how come in the New Testament when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, the Jews wanted to stone him, the Bible said. Why? Because he maketh himself equal with God, meaning he's saying as a man that he is the same as God in heaven, that they're one and the same. I lived in New York City for 10 years. One thing I used to love to do, uh, especially Hasidic Jews, because they're the most devout and the most religious I would frequently, I probably asked, I, honest to God, I probably asked a hundred or more over the years, Jewish people, I'd say, listen, I want to ask you a question, and please understand, I am not, I am not trying to convert you, I'm not trying to preach at you, I am a theologian, and I'm asking strictly to understand the Jewish position on this issue. Who did Jesus Christ claim to be? Do you know what every Jew, every single Jew I ever asked that question, do you know what they answered me? God. 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 Jesus Christ claimed to be God. Now you got dingalings, cults running around that try to deny the deity of Christ, try to deny that he is God like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, and they try to deny that he is God. Yet, 
the Jewish faith, the Jewish people, that's exactly what they understood him to claim to be. And that was, in Jewish teaching, that was heresy, and heresy was deserving of stoning. So this is why they wanted to stone him. And if you remember the story, the Bible said the Lord literally just walked through the crowd and passed through the crowd. He literally disappeared into the crowd. And that's what saved his life, is that he was able to just walk into the crowd and disappear. So when Paul said no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, if he had simply said that Jesus is Lord, well, Lord can simply be a title, meaning uh, one who owns all or one, or one who is in ownership of, you know, one who possesses and controls and owns. But when he said that Jesus is the Lord, he is literally saying no man can say except with the help of the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ is God. He is the Lord. Hear, O Israel. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. Okay? So we understand that there are certain things Paul saying, if the Holy Ghost is working with someone or through someone or in someone, they will not speak evil of Jesus the man, nor will anyone be able to say Jesus is God the Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Then he goes on to say, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So Paul says, there are nine gifts. There are different gifts that the Spirit of the Lord gives to various people within the church. He said, but, and this is extremely important, but it is the same Spirit that is administering every one of these gifts. Say, okay, Pastor, why is that so important? They, it's important to understand because we are not channeling spirits. We are not channeling the dead. We are not channeling saints. We are not channeling Mary. We are not channeling the apostles. No. All the gifts of the Spirit are administered and operated through and by the same singular spirit. And that same singular spirit is the spirit of God. Okay? He said, and there are differences of administrations. These gifts are applied differently. They work differently from one another. But again, it's the same spirit. It's still the spirit of God. And there are differences of administrations. These things are applied and used differently. But it is the same Lord. So it's important to understand there are nine gifts, but one of these gifts does not come through Mother Mary, and, and I'm going to explain in a minute why I'm using Mary as an example. And then other gifts are, you know, are other spirits of, of apostles or spirits of, you know, other individuals. No, we're not channeling the dead. Every one of the gifts of the Spirit are manifestations of God himself, the Spirit of God himself. He said, and there are differences of operations these things work differently, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. He then goes on to say in verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit. What is manifestation? That which is visible, that which is seen. If someone says that a ghost manifested itself, that means that you saw it. You were able to see it with your eye. Paul is saying the manifestation of the Spirit. God does things that can be seen with the naked eye. He heals. He fills with the Holy Ghost and you speak with other tongues. These are things God is doing but that we see with our eyes, okay? 
the manifestation of God's Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. So everyone that God manifests himself through by reason of the gifts of the Spirit to profit with all. Those things, he does not give them to you so you can put up a placard on the wall and say, oh, I can tell the future because I have the gift of knowledge. You can't put a placard on the wall and say, I'm a life coach because uh, I have the gift of word of wisdom. Put a sign on the wall, I'm a healer, so come to me. You know, No, no, no. The gifts of the Spirit are not given for your profit. They are not given for you to use in any way to profit or benefit yourself. That includes some of these charlatans that run around claiming to have healing ministries, and they wind up rich and living in mansions and all this other foolishness. Oh, honey, they're going to answer to God in the judgment one day. Because that gift is not, if that gift is genuinely operating in you, of course, a lot of these I don't believe it is, but if that gift is operating through you and in you, then it is not for your profit. It is not for your benefit. It is for the profit of all. And Jesus told us at one point, he said, when he told the church to go out and preach, he said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. And then he made this statement, freely you have received, freely give. Salvation and the power of God doesn't cost you nothing, and you don't charge for those things, okay? So under no circumstances are the gifts of the Spirit meant to be used for any kind of personal profit, personal gain, or personal benefit. Then he begins to break the gifts down. He said, for to one is given by the Spirit of, by the Spirit, the word of wisdom. Now I gave you an example a little while ago of a word of wisdom. A lot of times when God operates through someone with a word of wisdom, and, and he can use anybody to do this. But when the Lord gives someone a word of wisdom for another person, because again, he doesn't give it to them for them, he gives it to them for others in the church. And when the Lord speaks to somebody with a word of wisdom, a lot of times they don't even realize <laughs> that the Lord just used them. They, they don't even realize that God dropped a word of wisdom in their spirit. And that what they just spoke was what the Spirit of the Lord had placed in them to speak. Somebody comes to them and they're troubled and they're going through a hard time and they don't know what to do. They're confused. Uh, they could do something really foolish. They could really make a big mistake. They could cause the uh, issue to become worse. They really need to hear wisdom from God. And that person, if they're a sincere believer and they genuinely have a desire to be a benefit and of help to another person, the Spirit of the Lord, because the gifts of the Spirit operate at God's will and at God's discretion, not at ours, and the Lord will drop a word of wisdom in your spirit. And what makes a word of wisdom interesting is a believer who's in tune with the Lord, when you hear a word of wisdom, like I was saying earlier about what really goes in me, you will receive the witness of the Holy Ghost that that's a word of wisdom. You'll literally, something inside of you, you're going to feel and sense you know what? I just heard a word of wisdom. That was not just somebody giving me advice. That was a word of wisdom. Now, can somebody give a word of wisdom and you don't recognize it as such? Yeah, sadly, that happens sometimes. But this is why it is so important as believers that we understand the gifts, that we understand how these things work. Because if you understand how a word of wisdom works, then you're open to receiving one when it comes. 
if you don't understand that this gift is even out there and that God even does this, then obviously you're not ever anticipating it, expecting it, or even thinking for a moment that it might arrive. But there are any number of occasions when the Lord will use someone to impart a word of wisdom. And what's so important about a word of wisdom, oh, I'm telling you, wisdom is something that comes with age, comes with experience. Wisdom is something that the Word of God said if we lack we ought to ask God for it because wisdom is so important. It is such a, a necessary thing in our lives. And the Word of God said, if you lack wisdom, ask God. He, he will give liberally, okay? We need to ask God. When I started out in ministry as a young man, my grandmother, when I was growing up as a kid, my grandmother was famous for uh, we had a pastor when I was a kid. He was only about 30. And my grandmother was constantly griping. He was too young. He was too inexperienced. He lacked wisdom. He lacked wisdom. He didn't have the wisdom he needed. Blah, 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 blah. And I used to hear my grandmother constantly talk about, you know, Brother Babcock lacking wisdom, you know. And it drove me nuts when the Lord called me to preach and I first started ministering. I started out as a children's evangelist when I was 12 years old. And I did that until I was 16. When I was 16, I didn't stop wanting to do the children's ministry. But all of a sudden, I began to be invited to preach. As a young adult, you know, I began to be invited to preach. And I started preaching evangelistically. And my children's ministry kind of faded, you know, away. And then when I was 19, I started my first church. The Lord spoke to me to start my first church. But when the Lord called me to preach at 12 years old, I began to study the scriptures in earnest. Boy, I really, you know, begin to dig into the word of God. And one thing I used to pray growing up, because my grandmother was constantly griping about Brother Babcock, not having any wisdom, and the Word of God said, if you lack it, ask him. So I prayed as a young man, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. I beg God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. There are so many things that the enemy can sow, you know, thorns he can sow into the church, divisions, strifes, difficulties. A pastor needs wisdom. You need wisdom to know how to thread the needle when it comes to the right answer to a certain situation. Wisdom is literally like an arrow that's able to find its way through the eye of a needle, okay? Wisdom is an answer that is the perfect answer for that situation even though that situation may even appear as though there's no answer, okay? Wisdom is the perfect answer. It will accomplish all the right things, okay? So a word of wisdom is so important because it is the perfect answer to whatever that word addresses. It is threading a needle. You may not have figured out a way to thread that needle, but God knows how to do it so that in the end, all the aspects of that situation will be resolved in a positive, constructive way, godly way, okay? So wisdom is extremely important. Word of wisdom is extremely important. I am always, always listening. Uh for a word of wisdom. And I know as a pastor, God can use members of the church. God can use people in the church to give the pastor a word of wisdom at times. And that preacher better be open to that. If he thinks he's so smart that he knows everything and he doesn't need, um, no, the gifts of the Spirit, that's not Brother Jones. That's God working through Brother Jones. 
And therefore, pastor or not, you better be open to hearing the word of wisdom. So, so a word of wisdom is uh, extremely important. And uh, let me see here. Okay. Uh, I prayed as a kid for wisdom constantly. I, I mean, literally, because my grandmother, if I heard her talk about my pastor lacking wisdom once, I heard her talk about it a million times. She, she constantly griped. He didn't have wisdom. I, I think she liked the idea of an older pastor, you know, a more experienced man. He had a young children and a young family, you know. Well, anyway, so I was constantly praying for wisdom. When my first church, when I started my first church, I was 19 years old. I had a situation arise in the church uh, involving one of the ladies in my church. And to be honest with you, she had become infatuated with me. And she was a married woman. She had become infatuated with me. Well, some way, somewhere, somehow, she told her husband that she had become infatuated. Well, of course, he wanted to quit coming to church. He didn't want to be part of our church anymore because her, his wife had the hots for the pastor. And, you know, and uh, I was I was halfway decent back when I was 19, folks, you know. <laughs> I may not be the cat's meow now, but when I was 19, I wasn't so bad, okay? And uh, he didn't want to come back to church. He was upset. So anyway, one uh, Sunday, she asked me if she could speak to me. And uh, I always told, I was a holiness preacher at the time. I always told our church members, the ladies, said, if, if you uh, need to talk to me, please bring either your spouse or bring another lady in the church or something to come with you. I will not be alone with you in a room, okay? And that's to avoid, that's for integrity. Uh, that's something you learn in ministry. It's very important to guard your integrity and to be careful not to put yourself in a situation where somebody might um, misunderstand or make an accusation, whatever. You know, you, you just want to protect your integrity. So I, you know, I said, if you ever need to talk to me, get a lady in the church or somebody. So she got Connie, this lady got a woman named Connie, an older lady in the church, and they both came to me. And she said, I really need to talk to you. I said, okay. So I took them off to the side, and she told me what was going on. And I stood there for a minute, and I thought, oh, boy, what a situation. And I thought, Lord, give me wisdom. And I looked at her and I said, you know, Sue, the enemy will use all kinds of tools in order to get you to step out of the will of God. I believe y'all are supposed to be in this church. Y'all believe you're supposed to be in this church. And the enemy is trying to throw this as a wrench in the works. I said, now listen, uh, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen, number one. And uh, number two, you've got you've got to identify this as the enemy trying to sow something to dislodge you and put you out of the will of God. If you acknowledge that, then it'll make the whole thing a lot easier. I said, now, here's what you need to do. You need to go home, talk to your husband, tell him that you came and spoke to me, told me what was going on, and tell him exactly what I just told you. This is the work of the enemy, just trying to dislodge you and put you out of God's will. And secondly, it ain't going to happen, okay? Tell him those things. So she did. They came back to church. He came because he had missed a couple of services. They came back to church, and he came to me and apologized and everything. I said, you don't have to apologize. I said, I'd have been as uncomfortable, you know, probably as well. But uh, those people wound up serving as interim pastors of that church after I left. You see how important it was that they be there? 
You see how the enemy was trying to cause a problem in the church? And a word of wisdom helped to resolve the issue in a perfect manner. Well, when I spoke to my district pastor, who happened to be the, at the time was the same pastor I had done my internship in the Church of God under, uh, I talked to Brother Carver, and I told him what happened. I said, Brother, you're not going to believe this. I said, you know, one of my members came to me, and Bubba and I explained to him, and I told him what I said and what I did, and he looked at me. Brother Carver was at least 30 years older than me. Brother Carver looked at me, and he said, Chuck, he said, I knew it when you were my intern. He said, but I know it now. He said, God has given you wisdom way beyond your years. He said, do you know how many young preachers, if a woman in the church came to them and told them that, do you know how many young preachers would have blown that all to pot and probably said something stupid and caused a real problem? And, you know, he said, that is a tricky situation to deal with. He said, but my word, son, the Lord really helped you to answer that wisely so that there was a good, a good outcome, okay? Now, that's an example of wisdom in general, but the point is, that is the kind of thing that a word of wisdom addresses. When you can't find an answer and you can't find direction and you're unsure of what to do or how to do it, so that the outcome in the end is, is the best outcome possible. A word of wisdom oftentimes will give you the direction that you need. And uh, I've had, uh, growing up as a kid in church, I'm telling you, uh, there were people in our church that the Lord used in this area. And if you needed a word of wisdom, if you needed a word of wisdom, you knew who to go to. You knew who the person in the church was that the Lord would use to, to give you a word of wisdom. There were people in our church growing up, and I'm going to, because it's getting toward 9 o'clock, I'm not going to begin it this week. I'll, I'll do it next week. Uh, we're going to talk next week about a word of knowledge and, and uh, But I'll just say this, there were people in our church that the Lord used regularly with a word of knowledge. And uh, they would know something, they would tell you something that they said the Lord put in their spirit to tell you. And it was something they had no way in the universe of knowing except for God. And... Uh, and again, a lot of times it comes with direction. You know, it comes with giving you some sort of guidance and counsel. And, but it comes directly from the Lord based on knowledge that this person does not have. There's no way in the universe they could know. And, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that next week because there's some wonderful examples I, I, I look forward to sharing concerning a word of knowledge. Okay, was that okay? Uh, those of you watching, if you want to shoot me a thumbs up or something and let me know if that was okay this week. You know, we laid the groundwork. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, honestly, I appreciate the feedback because that helps me to know I'm doing my job. I'm trying to do it well, and, and I'm trying to expound these things uh, so that you understand. I'm not trying to be up here just talking and beating the air. I want to speak in a manner that helps you to clearly understand the Word of God. All right, let's go to the Lord one time more in prayer as we close this Bible study. I'm excited about starting our Bible studies again. I hope that you'll enjoy them and benefit from them. I hope you'll come be with us every Wednesday at 7. Uh, I will try, certainly, to close it out before 9 o'clock. 
Um, you know, I don't want to go past 9 o'clock, but I'll try to close a little earlier than that. I don't want to go too long and bore you either. Okay? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close. Master, once again, God, we thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your presence and your power. We thank you, God, for the reality of the Spirit of God and your presence in our lives and in the church. You, Lord, have provided us with tools that help us to live our best lives. You said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And the gifts of the Spirit are given to help us, Lord, have healthy, prosperous, benefited lives. Master, in the name of Jesus, help this simple teaching that I've tried to offer tonight. Help it, O oh God, to reach the deepest part of our heart, not just our thinking, but our hearts. Help us to understand the principles and the uh, truths which we've discussed tonight. Master, keep your hand upon every individual who's watching, those who will watch later by reason of recording. We live in a dangerous world. It's a, it's a difficult time. So much is going on. Keep your hand upon us, O oh God. Keep us safe and in your care. We ask it all and none other than Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. God bless you, folks. I hope to see you Sunday at 3 o'clock. We resume our 3 o'clock service time this Sunday. And then next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, okay? God bless you in Jesus' name. It's our prayer.